further ado, I, I did call on our four panelists tonight. Um, Sonia asked her, can you get some, some local uh, women together that might be interested in this topic? Uh, every single one of them said yes right away with enthusiasm. Uh, just amazing women. They all have such different stories. Uh, they all have a connection to Bar Haven. Uh, so without taking up too much time, I would just like to let you know who we have here tonight. Uh, everybody knows, of course, our moderator, MPP, Lisa McLeod. Um, <laughs> Montreal here in Bar Haven. Um, to her left, we have Stephanie Hora. Well, Hora. Howard. Hora. Howard. Um, Howard. <laughs> yeah. She is the co founder and head of people and brand at Mad Radish. I know all of you know Mad Radish. Um, and once I, I, I've told the story a couple of times, but Stephanie actually comes from Toronto and Montreal because she's all over the place. Uh, they're actually franchising their. Their, uh, their Mad Radish right now. Um, and she's one of the busiest ladies on the planet, but she flies in here in a car for like, a morning breakfast with the DIA. Uh, she's just wonderful. And I do want to say, um, again, thank you to Audrey, of course, for everything you've done. But also to Crystal, uh, Stephanie, yesterday we had a bit of a, a pre-teams call, uh, just some panelists to get to know each other. and. She said that all the BIAs and all the businesses that she operates uh, in different areas, different cities, not even just Ottawa, that our haven um, is by far and large the best BIA that she works with. She has some great stories and uh, operates. I think you and your husband have more than one business, right? So, yeah. So she has uh, some great insights to share with us tonight as well. So, Lisa, I think I will pass. You already have us. So we need that us. microphone. And, uh, we'll get started. Yeah. Awesome. Well, congratulations, Andrea. Good job. <laughs> yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lisa McLeod. I'm your uh, member of provincial parliament. I'm the longest serving. MPP in the city of Ottawa, and I am just back off of sick leave. And so I do have a lot of P and D and D, that's not this and vinegar, it's passion and vitality. Uh, <laughs> just wanted to say a, a few uh, thank yous before we get started with this, these panelists who are incredible and, uh, and true leaders. I want to say thank you to Andrea. Andrea's been uh, steadfast, I remember when she took the job here, because that's how long I've been serving. Um, and uh, she's worked very hard, but also has made a name for herself citywide, which is incredible. So congratulations. Uh, Michelle, uh, thank you for your kind words and for being here. I am officially stealing 613 Day. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so Sonia Shorey, uh, what can I say? Andrea was right. You are a force to be reckoned with in stilettos. And I thought, you know, when I'm, I'm bipolar, so when I'm on a manic, you know, and I'm going, you're even more energetic than me. <laughs> so I don't know, that's incredible. So listen, I'm just gonna say this about Fitz. It was the best land acknowledgement, funniest land acknowledgement I've ever seen. But you being here today to speak about women is exactly why we need to be here. When I was Minister of Social Services and Community and Social Services and Women's Issues, I had a 17 and a half billion dollar budget. Billion. And the one thing I traditionally and always said during that time especially when we were dealing with missing and murdered Indigenous women and when we were dealing with sex trafficking, and I said this at the United Nations, strong women must support vulnerable women, but strong men 
must support vulnerable women. And when I look at you today, Vince, and I think of you, Jason, as the BIA chair, and I look at our city councilor, Wilson Lowe, and the other men that are here today, you are all supporting and empowering empowering strong women who are doing incredible things for our community. And I want to talk a little bit about that with them. So I'll tell you sort of how this is going to go down. Because we do have a couple shy people here. <laughs> 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 so we're going to start with Elon. So we have you and yeah, yeah, we're going to put the person that's uh, their, their language is English up first. But, but uh, Elon is one of my best friends and a uh, true sister to me. So a little housekeeping. There's three questions uh, that the BIAs, as well as uh, Invest Auto, will work on together. And so we're just going to go down the line. One, two, three, four. And then we're going to go to you. <laughs> One, two, three, four. Perfect. And so this pass her along when it happens. And if you give me the look like, I just I just want to stop, just give me the look. No, that's, that's it. And the camera's right over there. That's why I positioned it this way. <laughs> so we're going to start with Elon. And uh, I know her as a, as a business owner. She has a bubble tea shop that is one of my favorites in Westboro. She's a realtor. Uh, she does a lot of philanthropic work. Um, she's very supportive of my journey in mental health. And she's, of course, a new Canadian. So I want to I wanna ask, and this will be a question I'm going to ask all of you, about how much you've accomplished in Ottawa, not only here, though, and beyond. So, you know, I first met Elong actually in China and uh, she showed me her community and did some business there. So can you just describe a little bit about your business journey, the steps that you took in becoming a successful business owner and advancing your businesses, and one of your most positive moments throughout that journey. But that is a mouthful. So why don't we break it down to this? Okay. How did you get started? So what made you successful? <laughs> what do you want to share with everybody? And your friends are all recording right now. <laughs> <laughs> no successful business or some business woman but I do a lot of business yes small business um what I say well why don't I just ask you a, a quick one before we go on is you you really work hard in the Chinese community how important are the uh, relationships that you have within the Chinese community in making your business successful I got a lot of leads from Chinese community. <laughs> I, I serve as a volunteer. I know people from there. Because uh, as a first generation immigrant to Canada, I know this culture shock. When people come from overseas, they come here. They, they, they need advice. They need someone like, uh, like me, like uh, no have the experience in Ottawa. So I got uh, my leads, I got uh, the friends from outside of Canada from actually I want to talk about something about Ben Kung Chu. I know that so smart. <laughs> Very cool now. Yeah, we do have rent in China, in Shanghai, Hong Kong. So I got leads from there, yeah, honestly. So when people want to immigrate to Canada, they have opened their account, right? They have to get the money deposited to there. So Ben Kung Chu have rent there. How smart. <laughs> yeah, so I think as a first generation immigrant here, like uh, I do want to get fitness, I, I do want to survive, so I do involve a lot of events for our Chinese community. The first, uh, the first thing is yes, I do want fitness, but other things because I see people dependent. They, they, don't, they don't know where they have to go, they don't trust people, they don't know people here. So I want to help, like from like from here, like to be honest, I really want to help. And uh, yes, like I said, um, Lisa said I'm a sister for her. Yes, I can say she is my sister. I moved to Bay Heaven because Lisa, she's here. So I told all my friends, invest by heaven, buy house here, <laughs> do business here. Yes. So Take that, that's kind of phone that I have there. <laughs> <laughs> Because she did mention that the Bank of Montreal is expanding. And I gotta tell you, like, we're, uh, you're younger than me, probably, um, everybody is these days. But, uh, you know, I look at it this way. When I was younger, the bank tellers were women, the bank managers were men. So you're in a male dominated area, you're young, 
I remember the day they opened up, and Jason, you may have been there when Brian Orser was like cutting the ribbon. Remember that? That was exciting. So there you are in charge of that in the nation's capital. Uh, that's pretty impressive. So how did you get here? And you know, um, how do you keep being there? Because that's another issue women have to face. Yes, yeah, so I actually started, my journey started 18 years ago with Vic Control. Um, and so it wasn't actually the career path that I wanted to go. I actually wanted to be a lawyer. Um, and I decided to start with bank, the banking. And I actually fell in love, love with customer service. And throughout my years, it wasn't just the customer service, but it was actually seeing the success of my peers, helping my peers move on to, or just hitting a target or getting to where they needed to be. That's when I actually realized that leadership was exactly what I wanted. And so for the last 10 years, actually 11 years, I've been in the leadership role. And the last six years, I've been managing my own branches. And not just in Ottawa, I was actually in Toronto for four years. And so I had different opportunities in Toronto from a small branch to a large branch. And then recently, I actually just opened up the brand new location in Barhaven, um, which is a huge branch. If you haven't seen it, come look at it. It's very beautiful. Um, but we have, I actually onboarded 13 new employees with that branch. So going through talent acquisition, going through all of those stages, I think to get to where you need to be, you have to be, you have to have a top priority. My top priority was customer service and team engagement um, and leading by example um, and just having an open door policy. So as soon as you have that open door policy and having a team know that you're there to support them, you're gonna go so far. But did you have a mentor that helped you? Because you're giving a lot to a lot of people. You have somebody there. I had a mentor that throughout uh, about a couple of years and actually I'm actually mentoring um, two males right now in, my, in the market and I'm mentoring actually a few females too. Um, but I had a mentor to help me get, actually it's my mentor was my RVP at the time um, and he's still my RVP now to this day. And uh, it's, I think it's just, Constantly having that open door policy, and knowing that you're you're there to support, will lead you into the next role, yeah. and will keep you going. So, so that's a good segue into you step because it's a new role, right? You start off as employee one at David's Tea in Montreal, and then you decide, ooh, we're just going to give it all up, and right before the pandemic, open a big chain of restaurants called <laughs> Mad Radish, and now that's what you're doing. So. You know, why? Yeah. Um, right? I ask my therapist every day, why? I mean, David's Tea was an explosive success, and it was a surprise to me. I was working as an admin for about a decade. I was a promising young woman, a high school valedictorian who completely gave up on herself. And I just, I had kids and I put my head in the sand and I said, I'm just gonna toil in obscurity until I die. And I thought 31 was pretty close to death at the time. So now I'm much, much older uh, and realize I'm actually closer to death. But uh, so at about, yeah, at about 31, I had I was an event planner and I was working really late nights and I saw this ad on Craigslist that said, young entrepreneur, wants to start a tea company, needs executive assistant. And I was like, I, I drink tea. Uh, and that was the only qualification I, I feel that I had. And I met David Siegel, who's from Ottawa, founder of David's Tea, co-founder. And um, he said, let's do this. Like, I, I just need somebody to help me get things done around the office. And because I had been toiling, I knew how to do things. And this is the thing with women, it's like, we don't get handed the leadership positions, right? So we're doing the shitty labor. We're doing the, we're remembering people's birthdays and we're doing payroll and we're keeping track of our networks and we're learning administrative tasks so that the business can run while the men take the credit for it in some cases. And, and I knew how to do things. So he's like, we need a custom broker. I said, I've done freight forwarding. He said, I need payroll. I know how to do payroll. I basically was able to do everything, uh, including copywriting, because I, I was a good writer, I was a big reader, I was a good student. Uh, so I wrote all the copy for Mad Radish, and I wrote most of the copy for David's Tea, and named the teas, you know, Kiwi's Big Adventure, round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> it 
it was a good name. But um, yeah, so I mean, David's team, we go public, the company goes in a direction that, you know, you guys kind of see the results of that now, kind of crashed and burned. And David left right after the IPO, I left right after, and then it was like, what do we do next? And let's find something harder, uh, more, more backbreaking, and less likely to succeed. <laughs> let's do it in Ottawa, just to try something really new. And um, does that answer the... It was that. <laughs> said you were shy. Well, no, no. Now, Lisa, I've had a half a glass of white wine <laughs> on an empty stomach, and I drove all the way from Montreal. So. Oh, okay. Very good. All right. Great. One of, the que- one of the pieces of the questions, if I have I gone too far, you want to cut me off? No, no. Okay. At the end, it said something about what have you been surprised about, uh, or uh, at the end of that question, it was like, at one of your most positive moments yeah. throughout the journey. Yeah, if I could just say quickly, because like I'm, I'm, well, I'm sure we're going to talk about COVID after. What else is there to talk about? But uh, one, one of the, you know, it was really hard when we started Mad Radish, and I had to learn a lot. And I don't really know restaurants very well or food. And the, the big, like the best piece of the journey after all these years of imposter syndrome was when we sold our fr- first franchise out in Stittsville. And it did really well on opening day. Like people were lined up. There was, I, I hadn't hoped for that kind of success. I, I, I assume the worst. I'm a pessimist, and I wanted that franchisee to do well so badly. It's all that mattered to me. This is this man's life savings, you know. And like, I, I don't know. I would have. I don't know how I would have reacted had it not done well. But it was spectacular, and it's been consistently great. So that of all the things, of all going to you know New York City and ringing the bell at Nasdaq, of everything that we've done, I think it was seeing a, a vision be able to be translated into somebody else's wealth and success that was the most powerful of all that stuff. That is amazing. Great answer. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, Julia, you've had many successes and probably trials and tribulations along the way because you have own multiple businesses. Uh, the most recent one I think that you've opened, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, was when I was able to visit you uh, at your physiotherapy clinic um, near my old uh, um, office. And uh, you're doing some incredible stuff with kids. And concussion is a big passion of mine. My friend Phil is here. Uh, Phil and I uh, did, did Romans Law, brought in Canada's first concussion legislation. I'll see near and dear to everybody's heart here. But you're doing a couple different things. I mean, you're a business owner, manager, CEO, president, all that sort of thing. And then on the other side, you're still providing care. So how do you do all that? I mean, that to me is a success in and of itself. But uh, yeah, if you want to just touch on that. So um, I'm probably a little more nervous than everybody else that has spoken here, but it has been really <laughs> He does a lot of that. I advise him on some of it, but I'm not super involved in his things. Um, but anyway, I set him up for success with the kids. Hopefully, they're at school barbecue. I'm going to run off as soon as I can, not to leave this honey dry. It's so important for me to be here because I don't get to do a lot of things after hours, if you will. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, so our clinic, we are a pediatric therapy clinic uh, that we've opened up in Barhaven, and we're serving, you know, our official one year anniversary is on June 23rd. So again, this is kind of really neat to be here as we're approaching that one year. I was kind of looking at some of our metrics. And in our first year, we served 1,100 children in the Ottawa region. <laughs> Montreal to get services in our clinic because we offer some pretty amazing therapy that our clinicians have done. Um, you know, starting this business, I did it in the pandemic <laughs> um, with four children, four young children of my own, like I said. Um, you know, I kind of laughed, you know, my husband said, You really want to get away from your own kids because they were driving me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but it was very different, right? Um, you know, I, my journey, I did start as an athletic therapist out in the Toronto way. I got to be a clinic director at a small town clinic for five years, uh, as well as an athletic therapist. And I kind of always had this passion to expand what I could do as an individual therapist by changing my healthcare system. And I was going to get into politics, become the Minister of Health, 
you know, and change healthcare that way. Uh, so I did move to Ottawa when I met my husband. I did my MHA, which is like an MBA for healthcare at the Telford School of Management in Ottawa here. And then got into project management at hospitals, a huge corporate organization. Um, you know, and was very comfortable, if you will, worked very hard, but comfortable in a corporate cushy job that it was healthcare um, because of what they do in the software healthcare technology. Um, and I could bring my project management, some of my healthcare knowledge, but for many years I wanted to do more. And I was fortunate to have amazing leaders that knew that and they always helped me drive that connection in terms of what's your passion in life and career, has that tie into healthcare, and even though you're supporting, you know, like, uh, you know, a tech team or an R&D team, um, you know, find your vision and kind of what you do daily to support that. I was very fortunate. This is going to sound awful if anybody's been laid off. Your situation is different than mine, but I was very fortunate after being in a big corporate organization for eight years to get laid off with a very comfortable package. And it was what allowed me to have four young kids at home in a pandemic with a husband who, you know, an entrepreneur and all that, which is amazing, but also brings a lot of risk, gave me time to actually start this business. And I did it with uh, my partner, he is my son's pediatric physiotherapist, because my oldest son, he is you know, ADHD, neurodivergent, amazing, smart young man, but definitely threw me for a loop, you know? And then even after him, I ended up having three more kids, but it brought me into this world of pediatric physio, pediatric occupational therapy, and I always did have a passion for kids from an athletic therapy perspective, injury prevention, concussions, huge, like, you know, when I was in, in university doing my athletic therapy, I was definitely, you know, um, concussions back then were sort of in, in the assessment and return to play protocols were just really starting to come out. And I was always very passionate about that. Anyways, opened this business with my son's pediatric physio, Michelle Warren. So she's the actual sort of like really, she, she's the brains in terms of the technical, physio side of things. And I bring a lot of that perspective, first from a business point of view, from having operated massive budgets and all that kind of stuff, capital and everything, my husband's own experiences in terms of starting businesses, having a bit more of that risk tolerance around that. And then a lot of my own personal leadership that I always like, really had a passion for and wanted to do. Um, so we, you know, one of the things to having, you know, a young, young family, you know, I don't, I don't do a lot of hands-on care, I do some, my treatment hours are limited, you know, but also I just kind of had to work between the hours of 9 and 2 or 2.30. And, you know, quite often, I'm the mom that gets a call from a kid from the school, your kid's having an update, your kid's doing this, you need to come pick them up. So I needed to be in an environment and build an environment where somebody would understand if I'm in the middle of something and it's happened I'm in the middle of a team meeting, I get a call from the school, I pick it up, and I'm literally at my kids' school in less than 20 minutes because that's what I need to do to support my family now. A whole lot of things I've said, but some of the biggest success things for me um, to get to where I am now is number one, building an amazing team. So we have um, our vision. Um, you know, we've got our three values, if you will, our family, growth, and adventure, and we hire on those, and we hire for culture, and then we train the skills, right? Because, you know, we do have some super junior um, physiotherapists and occupational therapists that we have brought onto our team because they met their culture needs and they believed in our vision as much as we did in our values, and we're training them. We're investing a lot of money and time with the mentorship. Um, you know, a lot of time we just shut the clinic down, and you know, we're, we're training them. We brought in this DMI course, so this family that's going to be driving from Montreal. Uh, the fact that we have five clinicians trained in DMI, you know, it's, it's helped to spread the word. Um, so, building an amazing team, you know, has been there. I don't do it alone, um, you know, and, and really similar to kind of what um, Stephanie has said, the more that we can help the kids and the families meet their goals more than I can help my clinicians meet their career goals and their passions, um, that's what drives success for me, right? You know, I think there's Zig Ziglar, if anybody's ever heard of him, I'm gonna quote him, but you can have everything in life if you help enough people get everything they want in life, right? So that's really what drives me, and every time I see a family or I hear a family or you know, hear the anecdote about like, oh my gosh, the child was so excited, they finally got to tie their shoe, or you know, the mom or the toddler that wasn't walking yet, and they're just overly really excited that the kid could walk. It just brings so much joy to me. And then I bring the mom perspective too, because I have my own children come and see my occupational therapist and do sensory integration in my clinic. And my little guy just partially amputated his thumb, so he's starting physio and OT before he starts. <laughs> I believe in what we do. 
we need these services. I love our healthcare system, we do, we can, with all its flaws, but we need it to expand services for kids in Ottawa, and we're doing that. Good so job, that's great. That's inspirational. And you said you were nervous. Yes. <laughs> You're hilarious. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> all right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about COVID. You, you know, a couple of you have already mentioned it. Um, and you mentioned teamwork. And getting through COVID-19 required a lot of teamwork for teams and, and governments included, uh, companies, organizations. Um, but that's not the only type of challenge that you face as an organization, right? Uh, there's, other, uh, there's other things like skilled labor right now. There's a shortage. Um, there's a lot of kids right now that uh, might show up and they might not, uh, adults too. Um, the, the dynamic has shifted. So can we talk a little bit about that, Leanne, at, especially at the branch? Um, like how, what were some of the things that you faced, COVID being one of them, uh, where you were able to sort of rise up and meet the challenge? Um, you know, we all like to say pivot and resilience. Maybe we should erase those two words <laughs> from the dictionary after COVID-19. But, uh, you know, we, we use them a lot. So how did, how did you deal with that? And then th there's a whole new series of challenges that we never would have forecasted prior to the pandemic. So I would say in a large company, when we implement, like when something has to change, it normally takes years to actually change. Uh, when COVID hit, we had to pivot very fast. We had to adjust very quickly. And so we had to adjust the way that we service our clients, um, provide alternative solutions in a very fast manner. Um, during COVID, we were open, we never closed. Uh, and so for as a leader, we had to address the safety concerns from our employees as well as customers. And we actually had to teach them how to communicate virtually with customers um, because everything was done face to face. So we were teaching them how to have MS Teams meetings, how to sign digitally, electronically. Um, and so that was a challenge. Um, and it's actually fantastic because we can service customers anywhere in the world right now. And so, I do. And yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that was definitely a challenge. And then you also said about teamwork too. Um, in Toronto, I don't know if it was the same here in Ottawa, but in Toronto, um, getting supplies was difficult at the beginning of COVID. And so we had employees concerned of not having hand sanitizers or masks. And I was someone that I would actually literally go to every store on the street to see what they had as supplies. And I would actually be delivering them across all the branches in the market because it was a concern that people had. And so it was teamwork across all the leaders, but also teamwork with the employees that showed, that showed up every single day to be there to support our customers. And it was, we got through it, and we got through it uh, on top. Good, congratulations. Yeah. But, I mean, that's, it, it's really important to see, see that there's been success, right? Mm -hmm. And are you still using um, the digital format and still doing Teams meetings with your clients so that they can be anywhere at any time? Absolutely. Yeah, so if we give the option to either do face-to-face -face -to -face or if they want to do virtual, we do through Teams. And pretty much right now, I would say probably 85% of our documents can be done electronically. Oh, good. Um, and so you don't actually need to be in person. And it, um, it benefits a lot of people too, right? Everyone has very um, long, like, like for Julia, you have four kids, you're running a business. She doesn't have time to set into a branch, right? And a time to actually do a mortgage renewal. And so being able to do this remotely for us. And it's hard to sort of skip that meeting now because it's coming to you, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's actually, no, it, 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 it's a, it, there's been a positive benefit uh, outside of COVID that we can actually still use. Still Good. Yeah. And to what, yeah, exactly. Clock that. That's, that's really cool. So let's go do that, Steffi. So, so Steph, you know, you guys started a restaurant, right? You know, several restaurants right before the pandemic. So instead of, I guess, we all sort of know what happened with that industry. I, you know, was the minister responsible for uh, that sector, which was very difficult, the hardest of sectors. So every day I would wake up, and it was like what drove me, and that's why I go to sleep. I would, like, would I sleep? Because thinking about the problems they have. 
But maybe just because we talked a little bit about coming forward some of the successes, like, well, of course you've had twist and turns, and please share them. But at the same time, what were the little successes that you may have had with some of the challenges that you guys have confronted? Yeah, I think, you know, everybody knows what restaurants went through. So, yeah, it was devastating. We, we were a, an office worker business. That's who bought our product. So we had to immediately get out to the burbs. Um, our glue store did really well, but... Uh, it was devastating to downtown Toronto and Ottawa, and it can, we we're not fully back whole as what we were before. But to your question, Lisa, about like what good came out of it, you know, a lot of people in the restaurant business either shut down or went, you know, really went fully into ghost kitchens or tried to do, you know, grocery deliveries. Like sometimes you can pivot right out of your own wheelhouse, and you now you're doing something you don't really understand that doesn't have legs when a crisis ends. So we sort of were delicate about it. We didn't want to get into like food delivery, like home delivery, you know, these like good foods and all these businesses that are now, they had like phenomenal success during the pandemic and now they're all laying off 30, 40% of their workers. In our case, we were like, okay, what can we do that's close to what we're already doing that's still a focused pivot, you're right, we should ban that word, but you know, a focused pivot that makes sense for us. We're like, why don't we invent another brand so we have double the exposure on the delivery platforms that everybody's using now because they won't leave their homes for fear of, you know, d death by plague. So we were like, how about a product that's kind of closely related to, to bowls and salads, but serves a bit of a different demographic. So we're like, how about burritos? Like everybody would like a healthier burrito. Most burrito brands have this like fat bastard, masculine, weird vibe. And we were like, what about a more delicate, healthier, brighter burrito? So we, um, my CEO, his, his wife is Louisa. She's Colombian. She's an amazing cook. So she cooked up all these recipes in their kitchen during the pandemic, just the two of them. Just sat around and made guacamole and uh, you know, harnessed all of her knowledge and using like food that is authentic to the region. So we called it Louise's Burritos and Bowls and we launched it on Uber and skipped the dishes and we improved our performance by, we grew sales by about 30% consistently right out of the gate. So the, yeah, it was, it was like, a, it was a bit of a Hail Mary because things were bad. I mean, I had to lay off a lot of people. We closed two stores permanently, so we lost millions of dollars. And, obviously the, the cost to build those stores. But with Louisa's, we realized, oh, okay, we can do a line extension that actually has a real resonance with the marketplace. Um, and now we've absorbed Louisa's into Mad Radish. And now we just have like a more, uh, I would say a more complete menu that services more day parts, more people. Um, so we're better for it in that sense. I wouldn't want to go through that again. But it, it, it at least left us with some lasting positive outcome. Excellent. That is great. We talked a little bit about some of the successes that you had and some of the challenges, particularly with kids, right? And I remember going through those very long meetings, the cabinet making regulations, um, and in particular for facilities like yourselves, and we tried to get them open. Um, so what kind of successes did you feel that you you know, that you dealt with either in COVID, but quite honestly, there's lots of different challenges we all face. Uh, and, and I know in the healthcare sector, there's other challenges that, that some of us don't face, so. So, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges is definitely being, you know, a health clinic, if you will, for kids, right? When we were private, we were a private clinic, right? We were a private for-profit clinic for kids, right? So that in and of itself, being in Canada, thinking that, oh my gosh, I should pay for healthcare. Um, that poses, you know, obviously some concerns and, you know, when we go talk to doctors or even when we do have clients call sometimes, their very first question, will you accept a way? And we don't, right? Um, we're not a market funded clinic and, you know, one of the things that this does drive, like we, we are lucky there are some families that are funded through things like the Jordan's Principles, so um, Indigenous children, they can have funding if they um, can get approved through that. We do have many children who are funded through the Ontario Autism Program, uh, you know, through all the ups and downs of that. Uh, we do have children through Children's Aid Society that do get some funding. But the majority of our children are either their parents do have extended health benefits or they do pay their pocket. So this daily drives me to make sure that the experience, the quality of what every family member, every child that comes through our doors is getting is exceptional. Right? 
Like I said, we do invest a lot in our team to train them, you know, to continue with the education, to make sure that they understand daily why are you here, who are you here to serve, right? It's not just them. You know, my job is again to make their careers fulfilling. You know, obviously help them pay their bills. You know, kind of earn the kind of you know money that they want to earn for their lifestyle choices and whatnot. But every day, it's you're here to serve children. You know. And we look, where can we expand? You know, a lot of it even is just educating. What exactly is pediatric physio? What is the cover? You know, literally from newborn babies, you know, a couple weeks old who are having challenges like the certain some sort of colitis or already have, you know, a known genetic condition that they've been diagnosed with, right up to teenagers, you know, who are dealing with mental health issues, they're having, you know, struggles who do have autism spectrum disorder other kinds of rare genetic conditions or just a regular, you know, like soccer athletes who come in and have an injury or swimmers or concussions or whatever that it is. So, you know, I think that, again, kind of, you know, people, oh gosh, your kid's money and you're charging people money and, you know, and, and we'll owe him and how can you do that? Um, you know, we are here, of course, you know, like this is my career now, you know, um, but make sure the quality is there. You know, the client experience is amazing. You know, um, you might see one of the things here. So there's stickers in the back. And what this is, you can't read it, but it says, uh, my fun, so F-U-N, capital, functional goals. And some lines where kids get to write this in, and then they can, there's a little site saying, I believe in myself, and they can write their name in each. And if you come into the clinic, or you check out our website or social media all over, we have what's called a goal wall. So every child that comes in, for the most part, they should be getting this after their assessment or as they go through. Because some kids are, we call them lifers, if you will, whatever their condition is, they're coming in weekly or a couple times a week. And so as they have new goals, they get to put this up in the clinic, kind of like when we used to go to the dentist and they would take our picture if we brushed our teeth. But they can put their goal up, and my staff, my team, myself, I have a goal on my wall as well, and it's there to remind us all that we have goals, right? And someone's goal could be, I want to stand. Someone else's goal can be like, I want to write better, you know, print for school better. Uh, you know, I want to interact better socially, whatever it is, right? But everybody has goals in that. And that's part of our, you know, everybody gets one of these to take home as well, uh, to remind themselves at home, right? Because it's not just coming into the clinic once a week or however often you come, but it's all the stuff that you do at home as well. So that's really, you know, kind of what drives me through some of these hurdles of, oh, you're going healthcare, we have to pay a pocket, and, you know, and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's all mine. Yeah, that's right after. <laughs> <laughs> Doctors will say, Go to Geo. Six months, your little baby's gonna wait on the Geo list. And it's six months, but to wait, you know, with like improper function and movement, it's not acceptable. I know it is what it is right now, and there's a lot of reasons why the health system is, you know, the way it is. But if you can come in, and the earlier you can come in, early intervention for so many things, the, the better your outcome is, the long term success, the less you're gonna have other kinds of challenges and issues potentially later on in life. Right, so we're just you know serving the kids and the families. Yeah, I'm gonna have to take that uh, course on how to have better handwriting because I could actually be a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll go to the Elon Musk starting right uh, now. And so Elon, I guess I'll ask you the, the question we've asked everybody. You know, we've had so many challenges over the last little while. Um, you know, what were some of the twists and turns, some of the successes? And then when we're finished with you, we're gonna do a rapid fire. Three times, everybody's got 30 seconds to sort of just shoot some questions off and then we'll just go down and back, down and back. Yeah. Okay, before you I like answer the question, okay. I would ask, ask, I would ask them, how do people like uh, amazing like they are, but they say they're shy and they're scared? <laughs> so it's uh, making me more nervous. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing great. Is Elon doing great? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So before I come here, I asked my son, I said, I'm going to do some presentation today. Uh, I said, you know, I don't speak English very well. What can I do? He said, ask the chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I didn't do my thing. So if the question gonna make me feel yeah, like I, I, I will do, I need the chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so what's the question? <laughs> And then, how did you overcome them? And did you find During any success? the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, I know you so, bought like a bunch of houses. 
fear of our name. Yeah, <laughs> but I just want to talk about the uh, you know, real estate tonight, you know, the mortgage hack to every, you know, right now, real estate is no fun at all. So, <laughs> but I do, like, I had fun during the pandemic about the real estate. I'm well, sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but, you know, because uh, the pandemic, like, a lockdown, but the, like, the only fun time is showing the client, you know, virtually, because I'm the only one can, you know, book the showing, they bring my camera, and they show the client, you know, welcome on the house, of course, with mask. And but the some uh, exemption, like, uh, I can bring the client to the house to take a tour. I think that's the only time, you know, people can get out of the house, you know, with the free protection. And uh, yes, I had fun during pandemic. <laughs> but for the other things, the, you know, you, you mentioned about that I had the bubble tea store open. Yes, I opened like a during the pandemic. We have a pen store. Yeah. From Toronto to Ottawa, Oshka, and the, you know, the Toronto area. But they did a good business because we using a lot of the digital market, like we do a lot of delivery, a lot of promotion. We spend a lot of money on that, but we got a lot of customer, like uh, uh, five, what do I say, like a five star uh, through the Google review. Yeah, so, yeah. your top eats on Uber yeah, and all that and stuff. And I do asking a lot of the Chinese restaurants, the, the business owner, like even for Black Heaven, they said they did a great job and the triple that their, you know, sales. Can you believe that? I don't believe that, but they did a good job. Good, 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 yeah. good job. It was always good. But, but I feel like it's post, post COVID is more difficult, it's more challenge here. Yeah, because the people already like to change their their mind or their style. Like uh, I'm still like old school sense. I don't look at the Instagram. I don't look at the TikTok too many like too much time. But right now, like young people, they are really like a focus on. They do. They see the advertise from the TikTok. They see from Instagram. But for for the people like me, I don't look at them. I still want to go back to the old school way, like back to the restaurant I used to go. But you see, a uh, new things comes up. Um, I don't know. I'm still in the adjustment. I need to adapt and adjust. Them, right? You're doing a good job. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna actually give it to Stephanie. Okay. And so Stephanie, so you're gonna go. I'm gonna ask a question. We're doing 30 second one, and then going to you, and then because this is quick, and uh, you'll be okay with me right on. <laughs> you guys are just doing this to the. <laughs> oh, I'm afraid of you. Do you live in Barhaven? Yeah, I'm from Oh, well, this is amazing. I'm just joking. I used to represent that one, so it's a deep work. Guess if I'm old age, I'm just getting away from the last thing. All right. Yes, ma'am. Quick question, 30 second answer. Okay. How do you access equity? What? You <laughs> <laughs> called David Siegel. <laughs> okay, I'll ask you a different question then. I was trying to steal from you. I know, no, I don't have any money at all. At least I would, I would tell you if I did. Okay, all right. So restart for 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, better not ask who has access to equity anymore. <laughs> no, ask BMO about that. Yeah, we'll call your financial advisor. Yeah, we'll call Leanne. <laughs> All right, how do you define success? Okay, I'll do that in 30 seconds. You can't, okay, here we go. So one is, um, am I super, super proud of my product? Listening to Julia talk about her service, I think that's extreme success. So anybody that can speak at length about how amazing their service or product is, okay, good, one. Two, um, have I figured out who my customer is? Do I actually know anything about them and do I know where to find them and do I know where to find more of them? That's marketing talk, you guys get the idea, but I spend a lot of time in just market research. And then three, my favorite is uh, a legacy. So um, mm -hmm. mentorship, one, most important to me, uh, young people that I mentor. I love that you said you're mentoring young men. I think it's not about girls or boys. It's just about developing young people. Two is environmental legacy. So we only do plant-based packaging. I got a fork made out of agave pulp. Yeah. Uh, and then three, keeping it on time for Audrey, is, um, uh, you know, the people that you're you're affecting so like am i making someone's life a bit better certainly in what you're doing uh that's an easy one and if you're serving a delightful bubble tea or if you're you know making somebody's financial dreams come true like we're doing something practical to improve the lives of people so that to me is success and so you can see at least i have no money to find success <laughs> we covered that but we have the other things <laughs>
dysfunctional, toxic, shitty workplaces or relationships. Move on! Uh, it can't be any worse, is all I will say. Mine's going to be short and sweet. It's lead by example. Excellent. Yeah, I was thinking about taking care of ourselves, like uh, physically, mentally, especially for business. Entrepreneurial, that's uh, the things we have to do. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Now, I have two questions. Two of the audience are here, that's okay. Would you guys be interested? And you guys can answer too, just show any other yellow. Would you guys be interested? I used to do these things called Women in Business Breakfast. Andrew would remember those. If I did one of those, would you like to do it? And we just do like the session? I'll do that. Okay, all right. We'll do that for shot shot. You're clapping, but you're the one who's going to be working on it. So. all of you for, uh, you know, I, I really only know uh, you and Julia, Elon, 
Daniel. So it was really a pleasure to meet both uh, Leanne and Stephanie today. Learned so much about you. And I think it's time for some networking. Don't you think, Audrey? 